going to uh, start our first panel today, The State of the Science of Reading for Supporting Students with Reading Disabilities. We will take questions at the end and provide note cards for you to write them down. My daughter, Fia Lucia, wave your hand, Fia. <laughs> She's like this. We'll collect the cards and I think provide them to Sarah so that we can read your questions and have them answered for you. Last night we heard from Emily Hanford, a fellow arena uh, person, uh, um, as our keynote. Today we welcome her as she serves as our first panel's moderator. Emily Hanford has worked in public media for over two decades as a reporter, producer, editor, news director, and program host. Her work has new won numerous honors, including the Excellence in Media Repeat Reporting on Education Research Award from the American Educational Research Association. Let's welcome Emily. Hello, everybody. Good morning, and thanks uh, for being here again. For those of you who were here last night, nice to see you again. Uh, I think I will invite my fellow panelists to come join me on the stage. Maybe I'll introduce them as we go. Um, so we have Nancy Nelson. She's an assistant professor of special, ed special education here at BU Wheelock and the Dep deputy director of ENSEL. Thank you. Elsa Cardenas Hagen, president of the Valley Speech Language and Learning Center, and Nicole Landy, who's an associate professor of psychological sciences at the University of Connecticut. Thank you all for being here. So we are here to talk about the state of the science of reading for supporting students with reading disabilities. And those of you who were here last night know that I, I knew nothing about any of this a few years ago. So I feel very humbled to be on the panel with these women who have known about so much more of this for so many more years than I have. Um, I talked about the story of how I got interested in this last night. And one part of the story that I didn't talk about is that it actually began with uh, college students. So I was doing a bunch of reporting actually in Connecticut um, on students who are ending up in remedial classes or developmental classes in math and English. And I was meeting a number of students who were telling me about their struggles with reading. And it really wasn't something that I had ever thought very much about before. And I was talking to professors who were talking about um, students they had who really struggled at a very basic level with just basic reading and writing. And that was when I learned about dyslexia, because I did a long interview with a student who was in college and had graduated from high school and sort of been told by graduating from high school that she was ready for college and she had a very clear goal. She wanted to be a nurse and she really couldn't read and write very well at all. She had made her way through um, high school sort of just barely with a sister who was slightly older than her who would read everything out loud to her and um, she faked it and uh, she used a lot of context clues and guessed and tried very much to not read if she didn't have to. And she had a really good memory and she just memorized a lot of stuff. And she got stuck in this remedial class and she wasn't gonna be able to get out um, if she couldn't find some other way to demonstrate her skills actually. She really wasn't gonna be able to pass the traditional assessments. And her instructor saw that and um, helped her get out of the class and the instructor lost track of her. And then several years later, the instructor was having surgery and she woke up and this woman was her nurse. <laughs> and um, so I knew I needed to track her down and I went into this really long interview. She had just had a baby who was about three weeks old and her baby slept most of the time and it was during an ice storm and we had this really long interview where she told me basically about how she made it through school without being able to read and how she made it into being a nurse. And she sort of memorized all the stuff she needed to know, uh, right, because our, our brains can our, hold a certain amount of information and, and really she doesn't crack a book for really any reason at all. Um, but anyway, this introduced me to dyslexia, which is where this all began. And I started to realize that people with dyslexia are really like canaries in the coal mine um, that are telling us that actually a lot of kids aren't really being taught what they need to know uh, about how to read the words 
and kids with dyslexia are the biggest casualties of this, but lots of kids are being affected. So I think what we have a panel here today who can talk very specifically to reading disabilities, including dyslexia, and we're also gonna talk about English language learners who have special needs when, when it comes to learning how to read. So I, don't, I guess I wanna do with all of you today is to um, just ask you to begin by telling us who you are and what you do and why you are here today on this panel about supporting students with reading disabilities. So sort of tell us quickly your story and why you're here. So let's start with Nancy. Great, thanks Emily. It's great to be here. Um, as Hank mentioned, I am a deputy director of ENSOL, so that is part of the reason I'm sitting on this panel. I lead our instruction and intervention work and have been very engaged in our technical assistance work. Um, I started my career as a special education math teacher, actually in middle and high school in Oakland and Berkeley, California. So I, um, I had the option actually of teaching reading and I chose math because it was something that came easy to me as a kid, whereas reading did not. I actually did not learn to read um, very, very easily. I, I grew up in a small mill town in Oregon uh, and Oregon was always looking to California for best practices and California is a very fad-ish state. Um, when it comes to the educational practices they adopt. So whole language was a very big thing and I happened to have a first grade teacher who saw that I was not learning to read based on the practices they were using and pulled me aside and I remember very well sitting on the rug with her individually while she was teaching me letter sound correspondences. I didn't need a lot of intensive reading instruction but it was something um, that I definitely carried with me across my career. So. I taught for a while and I decided I wanted to go back to school for a PhD in school psychology, went to University of Oregon. And if you know anything about University of Oregon, it is a very uh, reading uh, focused university, particularly in the special education program, led um, predominantly by Ed Kamanui, who is sitting in the audience today, who was also the founding director of the Center on Teaching and Learning, where I worked when I graduated um, for my PhD program and throughout my, uh, my graduate training when I got involved with an efficacy trial of the Enhanced Core Reading Instruction Program. And I was, based on my teaching background, I was really focused on the implementation side of that work. So looking at teacher practices and figuring out what those best practices were, um, how we could support teachers to implement them better, and uh, sort of got sucked into the reading world. I was, I was resistant at first, I think, again, because of my background. And I remember having conversations with Ed in a grant writing class where he was like, why are you focused on this math thing? Reading is so great. I'm like, I know, but everybody does reading work. I want to do something different in math. <laughs> it's hard to do anything not related to reading because it is so important for kids. Mm -hmm. And so I, have, uh, I still do math work, but I do a lot of reading work these days really focused on the implementation of multi-tiered systems of support around assessment and instruction and intervention to benefit students with or at risk for learning disabilities. And based on my childhood and experiences working in inner city schools, this is an equity issue for me. Mm -hmm. So I, I see this as critical. Um, I'm engaged in this work to support students with disabilities, thinking uh, very predominantly about special education, but really general education as well, knowing that most of our students with disabilities spend most of their time in general education contexts. And so I am very focused in my work on thinking about how we can support teachers to use evidence-based practices mm -hmm. to benefit students and use a prevention-oriented framework because we know that an early start helps everyone. Thank you, thank you. And you know, so often there's a personal story at the heart of why people do what they do. Mm -hmm. So Elsa, maybe you can tell us why, who you are, what you do, you. why you're here today. Thank you, so I'm Elsa Cardenas Hagen and I, by training, am a speech language pathologist. My father wanted me to be an accountant, right? <laughs> and he says, oh, you're never gonna be, you're always gonna be needing money, you know? You're never gonna make it in life. If you're an accountant, you'll do so great. So he sent me to go talk to Dr. Cooty, the neurosurgeon and I, to, at the hospital that my father had you know, really helped to found. And he says, uh, I said, Dr. Cooty, my daddy does not want me to become a speech and language pathologist. He goes, well, why do you wanna become one? And I said, because I have a friend who, you know, he is uh, he's considered deaf and mute and and I speak to him through sign language and I I really want to get into that and and he goes well you can do that and I want you to come back and you can work here in the rehabilitation center etc and so I went back and told daddy I'm not gonna be an accountant I'm gonna be a speech and language pathologist dr. Cootie said so right <laughs> my father his mission didn't work and so I got into school and and very quickly learned you know how beautiful language is and you could learn about language and then you know you have to go to graduate school and and I had to 
ask for special permission to get in because my math score wasn't as high as they wanted it to be, not for the undergraduate, graduate, or gra <laughs> you know. And I was like, please let me in, let me in, right? At the end, I ended up being the outstanding alumni for them. So I was like, it's determination, right? But what, what it, when I left uh, the speech pathology, there weren't jobs. And so um, I was in Houston, and they asked me if I would teach math. And I said, <laughs> no, you don't want me to teach math. <laughs> uh, so I married an accountant. Does that count? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so what ended up happening is I, they, I couldn't get a job in the schools, but I got a job as a speech-language pathologist in traumatic brain injury, right? And we were going to be starting this whole thing on, you know, how to do these coma stimulation protocols. And, you know, I could bring from the perspective of working with people from multiple languages, et cetera. And I did that, became like the supervisor, and I worked with thousands of traumatic brain injury folks, and I was on for 24 7. And then I wanted to raise our family, and I knew I couldn't continue with the, being always on call and working. We had 60 bed unit and it was intense work. So I decided I was going to move back home because that's what we do with our family. It's in our culture. We're going to have all the tias, all the aunts and the uncles. And so the hospital was like, oh my God, what are you going to do down there? There's nothing for you. So, and they didn't want to let me go. So they said, we're going to keep you on staff and you can find the traumatic brain injury people in your community. And I'm like, but there weren't very many because we don't have a big highway, <laughs> you know, where you get, it was pretty sick. I used to watch television to see who's going to be my patient next, you know, with Dr. Red Duke. I was like, this is terrible. I'm looking to see who's going to be my next patient. But it was that experience through head trauma to realize the brain is amazing. And if we can teach individuals who are missing part of their brain, who've had these brain injuries, if we can teach them again to speak and to communicate and to read and to write and to be functional in their community, why can't we do it for the students? So I started, I'm going to work and I'll just, you know, see kids after school, a little clinic here and there. And I began to realize that I was not prepared. I said, something more is wrong than language here. They can't read. And so I went for two years to the Nye House Education Center, flew back and forth to Houston for two years to get a specialty in dyslexia. And then got with family members and started this foundation called Brownsville Reads. It was going to be a five-year project. And that's where I grabbed David Chard in. I took him to places he's never been before. He goes, I will never forget where you took me and what you did. I get, But we brought in Reed Lyon, Louisa Motes. And Reed Lyon came, and he was there in front of We closed down the schools, and we had a plan with Norma Garza. We started this, a mother with you know, a child who had dyslexia. That's, we're going to do this together. We had the university, the business community. We had the school community, and we closed down the whole city, and everybody was there to listen to Reed Lyon and Louisa Motes. And it was there that Reed Lyon had to answer. He says, well, this is what we know. And, you know, the governor was having Reed go across all these places because he wanted, you know, to do better in literacy. And our teachers asked, excuse me, Dr. Reed Lyon, but what about English learners? What does the research say about that? And Reed didn't really have the body of evidence at that time, right? This is in the 90s. And so he goes back to Congress and gets $30 million allocated in Congress to start the Biliteracy Research Network. And of course, you know, we get to, we, we get to become the laboratory there. And I will tell you, um, it has been a great thing that in the 90s we started this scientific evidence-based instruction and here it is 2023, and we have never strayed. We're Eli Broad Award winners. We're A School District. We're NCUS winners. We are 100% poverty, 100% free and reduced lunch. And despite that, we have beaten the odds. That's my passion. That's my work. And I tell the 10 superintendents that have been through, hi. Uh, we have a strategic plan, and we will be here longer than you will be here. So get with the plan, right? And don't mess up what we're doing. And through that, I've had the opportunity to have, you know, UT Austin, Sharon Vaughn as my mentor, and work with University of Houston, David Francis, Jack Fletcher for all these years. And we have been uh, the laboratory to get the work done. And it is through the research that we've kept ahead. That's my story. Thank you. And I can attest that Reed Lyon uh, in my <laughs> Six hour interview with him <laughs> over three days told me that story. Oh, so good. A very, very important moment. Thank and you. I think it's an important point just to reiterate, which is that.
there was a lot of money made to really establish the research base on English language That's learners right. and this so-called science of reading, and so we'll talk more about that. And if you think you can't make a difference, here we are in the poorest community along the Texas-Mexico border, just families gathered together and to influence some, somebody like Reed Lyon, which, wow, and he helped us to get that work. And then the governor helped us very much. Governor George Bush. Yes. Yes. Yeah. He All says, right. we're going to do what you did for the whole state and then the nation. He tried. All right. <laughs> Nicole, let us know who you are and uh, why you're here on this panel about supporting students with reading disabilities. Sure. Uh, first, thank you all for having me here. Uh, my background is a little different. Um, I haven't been in a clinic or a classroom. That's, that's not where my training was. Um, but I did have some difficulty in school. I had paralyzing anxiety, and there's also a lot of risk factors in my family, um, both spelling and phonological, so a lot of those things weren't easy for me. Um, but I compensated and um, made it to college, and in college, I had some professors who studied reading. Um, they were cognitive psychologists, and I was really interested in what they were doing, and I joined their lab, and I became fascinated with this process. Right, how is it that our brain is able to do this? Right, how are we able to do both language processing, associate you know, concepts, semantic concepts, learn vocabulary, and how are we able to map print onto meaning? Right, and what is this thing we call phonology? And so that's, that's my background, that's where I started. And then in graduate school, um, I went to, to get my degree, my PhD, in an area that was relatively new at the time called cognitive neuroscience. Um, in college, at first I thought I wanted to be a doctor because I was really interested in the brain in addition to all these other psychological things and it realized that I just could never do that. I couldn't even be around blood. <laughs> so um, that was, there was like a lot of fainting. So that anxiety I mentioned, um, it was a problem for that. And so um, uh, cognitive neuroscience is this really interesting field where you combine all of these cool aspects of cognitive psychology, um, looking at processing and also with looking at the brain, the neuroscience piece. And I thought this was just the coolest thing. And so I went and got my PhD in that. Um, and I have uh, since been a developmental cognitive neuroscientist. I had uh, the privilege of working with some amazing people, both for my graduate work and my postdoctoral work, who have been foundational um, in, in the neuroscience and in the science of reading, really establishing how our brain does this um, fantastic, amazing thing that we do, and importantly, how that might be different in individuals with dyslexia or language impairment or comprehension-specific reading difficulty. Um, and so that that's what I've spent my career doing. And so what I do now um, is, is spend a lot of time thinking about what these neurobiological methods afford, what they actually can do, and what they can't do. Right? And they've told us a lot. They've been really instrumental for you know, establishing things like the phonological basis of reading, the importance of phonology and reading, um, and the importance of orthographic coding. Um, and also showing us that dyslexia is neurobiologically based, right? Um, and those methods are being pushed now to do more things. Um, and we can do some other interesting things um, with them, and hopefully I'll be able to talk a little bit more about that throughout this panel. Um, but there's some, some other things that they can't do. So I spend a lot of my time now kind of trying to think about that intersection. What do they actually bring us above and beyond what our cognitive science, our behavioral methods, and our clinical methods do? When can they de be deployed? What can they tell us beyond? Can they predict? Um, and so we actually are, are doing some work in schools now putting um, like ecologically valid um, neurobiological methods in schools to try to, to get a better handle on all of that. So uh, that's, that's what I'm doing. Um, and I'm here because, right, the reading um, is rooted in the brain, like all behavior, right? And so we can learn a lot about reading in theory, right, and, and about helping struggling readers from studying the brain and, and how we do this process and maybe how the brain changes in response to things like intervention. Thank you. I actually want to stick with you for a moment um, to ask you a follow-up, uh, which is, so one of the big ahas for me in learning about this is <clears throat> recognizing that I think there's a lot of language that I hear in schools, like every child learns differently, and we, all, we have to provide sort of something different for every single child. And a big aha for me was recognizing every child is different, right? Mm -hmm. But we all have brains that are actually more alike than they are different. There are differences, right? But, and we all need to learn the same things to become good readers. And I don't think it, I think this idea that everyone learns differently is kind of getting in our way. 
But I want to ask to a room full of people who are particularly interested in the needs of kids who have reading disabilities and dyslexia in mm -hmm. particular, what have we learned? What have mm -hmm. you learned about like what kids with dyslexia need that's similar or different from what other kids need? Mm -hmm. Like help us understand the spectrum even that Dr. Yeah. Whedon was talking to us about. Mm -hmm. Like what do, what do, is this, since this is about the uh, state of the science, I guess, about kids with reading disabilities, what is, what, what are the things that we've learned recently that everyone in this room should know? Yeah, no, that's a really great question. Um, and, and cognitive neuroscience, which is really what I do, right, can, can tell us some things, but there's a lot it, it can't do, right? And so in terms of the broader science, right, we know that kids need systematic, multi-componential, anchored in phonics, instruction, intensive, early, right, if they have learning disabilities. And a lot of that, for the most part, is what every kid needs, but more of it, right? More systematic, more intense, more long-term, right? So there aren't, you know, there isn't a huge message that is this fundamentally different there for dyslexic kids, right? One of the things that I'm really interested in that we're trying to do now, and I, I wish I had a better answer for this than I do, is why is it that there are some kids, even when they get that, that still don't respond, right? If I had the answer to that question, right, it, I, I would be doing something else that I'm, that I'm doing now, right? I'd be making sure it's happening, right? Um, but, but we don't, right? And so, and this is partly because you get to a really important point with that every child is different. In some ways, yes, every human being is unique, right? But every individual, right, we, we have a circuitry in the brain that is sort of optimally used for reading. There are other ways to do it. Um, and if you look at the data, right, um, it is actually presents sort of a unique picture. Most people, right, as they learn to read, right, as they get intervention, that circuitry changes and becomes more quote unquote normal, right? It, they start using that circuitry, they bring that circuitry online that they weren't using initially, these dyslexic readers. But not all dyslexic readers do that. We also sometimes see other patterns, right? We see a pattern we commonly call compensation, where they do it a little bit differently. They use regions on the right hemisphere that most children don't typically use as much when they're reading. Um, and so there's been a lot of work now trying to say, well, is that a bad thing? Is that a good thing, right? We don't have an answer to that question, right? So a lot of the work that I do now is trying to figure that out because we don't have an answer to that question, right? If you, we just did a recent meta-analysis in 2022 looking at all the intervention neuroimaging data to look at pre-post patterns, change patterns in the brain as a function of, of intensive intervention. There isn't a consistent pattern across studies. Right now, part of that problem, though, is because not everyone is doing the interventions the same way, right? So we're comparing apples and oranges, mm -hmm. right? We don't have enough data. We don't have enough neuroimaging data pre-post. We don't have enough longitudinal neuroimaging data. One thing you learn when you're in the schools when you test children is that their day-to-day, -day, their month-to-month -month performance isn't even necessarily stable, right? We don't have a lot of longitudinal neuroimaging data on children to actually see how it changes over time. There are some studies, don't get me wrong, but we don't have large scale studies with that data to be able to really dig into these individual difference questions, right? We know that the best things that work for all readers also mostly work for kids with learning disabilities. They need more of it, but they don't work for all. And so we're trying to figure out what those differences are, what the, where the uniqueness points are to say, oh, they actually do need something more than that too, but what is it, right? And so you know, that's the intersect we're working at now. Fascinating. So Nancy, maybe I'll move to you because you have been a special education teacher and uh, you now do research on the efficacy of reading interventions for kids at risk for learning disabilities. So what are some of the important things you're le learning that this audience should know about interventions? That's a great question. Um, so first, I just want to point out, you know, as we're thinking about things I want you to take away from this panel with, and one of those is that reading disabilities exist on a continuum. So even when we're talking about dyslexia, mm -hmm. the severity of dyslexia, it's, it's, not a, it's not a one thing. It's not a you have it or you mm -hmm. don't kind of mm -hmm. issue. And I'm not sure that any of us have talked about that yet uh, if you've been attending all of our events. Mm -hmm. So w what that means is, again, going back to the point I made earlier, we have a lot of students with reading disabilities or with dyslexia who are sitting in this audience probably or uh, in general education classrooms mm -hmm. for sure. Um, and the practices, uh, to Nicole's point, that we use to support students with learning disabilities also benefit regular readers. So using systematic, explicit phonics instruction in the early grades is really important for all kids 
and part of that is going back to Scarborough's reading rope and thinking about what reading is. Um, this idea, I, we, we talk a lot about teaching kids to read. Like, what does it mean to teach kids to read? And I uh, have a lot of colleagues that when we, we start talking about phonics, automatically tune out. They're like, oh, they're phonicators, right? <laughs> um, it's because we're talking about phonics, we must mean that teaching kids to read is only phonics. And that, that's a, a, a total um, misnomer. That's not true. So when we're talking about teaching kids to read, it is obviously much more complex than that. We need to consider all of the aspects of reading that go, go into teaching kids to read. But in the early grades in particular, and in a prevention-oriented framework like multi-tiered systems of supports, teaching kids phonics early on is critical because if we don't teach kids phonics early on, they don't have access to text to read independently. We know that independent reading is part of how students continue to develop their language and skills in vocabulary and comprehension. And by not providing that as an access skill, we are doing kids a disservice. And so a lot of my work does focus on phonics specifically and foundational reading skills because it is this access skill that we want all students to have that we know is particularly critical for students with reading disabilities. Um, so I, I want to make sure that we, we, sh we share that. It's also something that is a, a, a major weakness in curricula that are widely used in schools. So um, colleagues of mine will ask sometimes, like, what are, what are the problems with current uh, mm -hmm. curriculum that schools are being handed? And there are multiple problems, right? So um, publishers that are developing programs are, uh, they're intending to appeal to the masses. They're trying to publish these programs and scale them across the country. And so they're trying to make them look shiny and attractive. People buy them. Schools have a lot of packaged materials just sitting on the shelves mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in their schools because they used them, decided they didn't work, and then moved on to something else. We want, it, we want phonics to be part of those, those programs, and those programs often are too light in terms of their focus on phonics, or they teach it the wrong way, as in the three cueing method. Um, often, even if they do focus on phonics, it's not explicit enough. It's not connected to, for example, the text that we want students to be reading, where we're linking letter sound correspondence as students are taught to decodable text immediately so that they have experience uh, decoding text in words and connected text to build accuracy and fluency with connected text as part of this foundational reading skills uh, focus. So I think we're learning a lot about uh, reading interventions. I, I agree with Nicole that we don't know a lot about intensive interventions and what they should look like. There's sort of a an idea that we can intensify support by providing more time and smaller groups, and that's the way we're going to get kids to read. And it's, there's so much more to it than that. Um, we, we talk a lot about the, the idea that doing more of a bad thing or doing more of the same thing isn't necessarily a good thing. So what is it that we can do with our time to really intensify instruction? We have a, my colleagues and I have a, an IES funded uh, tier three reading intervention development grant right now where we're really focused on trying to design a curriculum that takes into account what we know about the science of reading and teaching multiple aspects of learning to read with other elements of, uh, of learning. So embedding uh, things like cognition and self-regulation components to support students to uh, better attend during, uh, during instruction. There's another panel right after this that's going to talk more about this sort of the whole child and thinking about the ways that reading interacts with, with other skills. So I think we do need to be thinking about some of those other aspects of learning as we're thinking about the interventions, embedding them um, with the science that we currently have. Thank you. I mean, given what you were both talked about, uh, Nicole and Nancy, I mean, I think one of the reasons that I, as a reporter, have been so interested in the word reading part of it is recognizing that when we're, that kids are, lear learning is a powerful thing. <laughs> and as you learn, you're training your brain. And I think some kids are learning an ineffective way mm -hmm. to read. Mm -hmm. And we don't know the answers to all the questions about why some of the kids who are really struggling despite really good instruction. But we do know that if kids either in the absence of a instruction can sort of teach themselves mm -hmm. an inefficient way to mm -hmm. read or they can actually be taught that. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and, and children learn from their mistakes, right? Mm -hmm. So if we're, mm -hmm. um, at, at the end of the day, what we're, how we're learning is this exponential thing and we're actually sort of statistically learning and teaching ourselves mm -hmm. a lot of stuff. So we've got to get kids off on the right path so they start to do the things that are going to be good for their brain mm -hmm. in terms of ending where you want them to end as a proficient and skilled reader rather than doing things that are going to take them down a path that turns out to be less effective and efficient. Mm -hmm. Maybe they can still figure out a way to do it to become a reader but mm -hmm. sort of in a not 
fully effective, mm -hmm. efficient way. So we talked about the research, we talked about intervention. I want to ask you a question about assessment because I think this is like mm -hmm. such a key part of all of this. Like, how are we identifying the kids that are mm -hmm. struggling? You know, then what do we do about it? But I think assessment mm -hmm. is a big problem in school. So one of your area of your work focuses on assessment systems, mm -hmm. particularly e early reading assessments for kids who mm -hmm. speak Spanish mm -hmm. as a first language. Right. So tell us about what people here should know today about the sort of science of reading and English language <coughs> learners and assessments in particular. Right. So first about the science of reading and about uh, folks that um, give misinformation that English learners were not included in the science of reading. And I can tell you that more than $100 million have been dedicated by the United States government to conduct this research. And people have worked collaboratively across many institutions in this country and other countries to work collaboratively. And it is true that when we look at reading and we're looking at children who uh, the majority of our work has been in Spanish-speaking English learners because close to 80% of our English learners speak Spanish. And so uh, you talked about the brain and you talked about, and this is one thing that drives me crazy when people say you only learn to read once. All right, I already know to read in two languages. I want to learn, my, my grandchildren are in, in a trilingual program and they're speaking Mandarin, and so I want to learn Mandarin and I want to learn to read in Mandarin, but I have to learn that structure. So I don't only learn to read once, but what I use, what I know is an asset because I have a literacy in my home language and that's an asset and I can make hopefully some connections to other languages that might be also alphabetic languages. And so when we look at, when we, I just want to get to the point that you're making about um, dyslexia and assessment, uh, what we know at this point in time is a, a language like Spanish is a very alpha, it's very tra what we call transparent language. You only have five vowels and they never change. So you never have to learn those six syllable types of the English language, but you do have to learn them when you learn English because you gotta figure out, oh, how do you pronounce those vowels? This is complicated. But what we find is that these students in these transparent languages, even students with dyslexia in transparent languages, what we find is, you know what? They can break the code. Code. And that might trick you. You think, oh, they don't have dyslexia because they got the code. But what you see in the transparent languages is they don't have fluency and they don't have spelling skills. And so that profile looks a little bit different as you look across uh, languages. And then also thinking about languages that are non-alphabetic, right? Uh, some of the, we talk about those processors, people, you know, when they look at these languages that are non-alphabetic, like in Chinese, looking at, oh, you know, they really get to that semantic and morphological mm -hmm. processor much quicker, but they're still using the, the, these same structures. And so in the 90s, we worked in the 90s, through the 2000s with tens of thousands of children testing in uh, English and in Spanish and we did this for the state of Texas and we were able to actually and by the way you talked about it being on you talked Nancy about it being on a continuum and I want to say yes you know there is a continuum for dyslexia but there's also a continuum of oral language proficiency and I see Ed out there like our heroes for English learners and one of the things here is that when we are looking at that if we don't look at oral we we have to look at oral language proficiency for these kids yes they're going to have trouble with that you know typically with the decoding with the spelling with that fluency uh, phonological awareness, phoneme awareness matters, and some people say, oh, well, we, we have a syllabic language, and so because of the, you know, the syllables, but we found that, you know, phonemes did matter, even in these languages, uh, and so that that made a difference as well. But what you have to do is, you heard Tracy talk about raise a, I say, I say raise a thinking teacher, because what we know is that you have to know your student, and you have to know what they're capable of, 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 what is their background. And when you do testing, you have to consider the context. Context matters. Their language of instruction matters. So if I had someone that was in a Spanish-only classroom, then I'm going to test them in Spanish. If they're in English-only, well, and most English learners, by the way, are serviced in English-medium classrooms, although we would love for them to be in dual-language classrooms, the majority of them are serviced in English medium classrooms. But as I make decisions, and that's why we have to get our leaders and our uh, professionals to know, 
if I have this student in an English medium classroom, I have the risk of misidentifying them. And because if I only look in English, then that's an incomplete picture. What is, you know, what do they have anything from their home language that could contribute to this? And what about their language proficiency? What about their knowledge from their home language? How, how long have they been in this language of instruction model? And here's the other thing. When we looked across, we were in three states doing this research, and we looked at language of instruction models, um, we need to do a better job of implementation, all right? It's because we saw differences from classroom to classroom, from grade level to grade level. So really know your student, know what they're receiving. If we only look in one language, that's an incomplete picture. And so there's a lot of work being done now looking at it across languages, trying to determine that. But here, here's what I want to say to the colleagues across this nation and some of our states that do not have universal screeners and they're afraid that children will be over identified with dyslexia, misidentified with dyslexia, and that it is racist to do a screening. This is what I have to say. We have 25 years of experience of doing this work. And in the state of Texas, we have 224,000 students identified with dyslexia. We have more than 5 million students. 1 million of those students have are English learners. 3% uh, of the students who are English learners are identified with dyslexia. And 4 to 5, it's closer to 5%, 4.9% of non-English learners are identified with dyslexia. So after all of these years, it's still less than 5% are identified with dyslexia. And we've been doing the screening for 25 years. So if we don't know what our students are capable of, and we're not talking about diagnosing them with dyslexia in kindergarten, we're talking about, ah, what are, what, are, what are their strengths and what are some areas uh, potentially at risk or, or that are weaknesses? And that is for me to become diagnostic and prescriptive in my teaching. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to help them so that they come out proficient. And, and I, think, I think it is scary to identify. There's so many factors and variables, but we have to train our school leaders, our principals, and our professionals on how you look at this, give them the guidelines, and with that, I think we can be successful, and we have been in our state. I'm going to move on to questions in one minute, but I want to tell you one thing, and then I want to ask everyone one more question, which is in preparing for this panel, everyone, we were having a Zoom call, and everyone was bringing up, well, people should read this, and they know about this, and know about that. So we put together a list of resources, and I believe you're going to get it in an email, or there's going to be a way for you to get several really key things that you might want to read. Mm -hmm. And before we move to questions, I guess I just want to ask you each to quickly think about sort of one thing you feel like the audience should sort of take away from this. Like, we want to end on a little bit of hope. Mm -hmm. um, and so what can the people in this audience who obviously are doing various things, but what's one thing you think people can sort of do? They should know and they could do. I'll start with you, Nancy. Oh, great. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, we, ha we know a lot. I mean, I would say that. I, I, um, there is a hesitation, I think to Elsa's point just now, there's a hesitation for numerous personal reasons probably to not look at the evidence or not believe the evidence, um, to discount it for various reasons. We have to start with the evidence. So I, um, I fully recognize that when we do uh, research, we are looking largely at group design research and looking at um, how things work on average for a population, recognizing that all of those individuals that are part of that group are individuals. They are different. They, there is customization or individualization that may be appropriate. Um, but we have to start with the evidence first because otherwise we're just shooting in the dark. So I would, re and these are, this is a critical issue, right? We're talking, at, Tracy's presentation, where we are talking about something that is essential. It's an essential skill for all kids. It is an, an equity issue. We need to make sure that we're providing the opportunities for kids to read. So please look at the resources that are being provided to you. Uh, scrutinize them for sure. Ask questions. Be open to having conversations. If you don't understand something because it's not your wheelhouse or it's not something you believe in, talk to people who are doing that work have those, those conversations so that we can move this work forward because if we all just sit mm -hmm. in our separate silos, we will not make progress. Mm -hmm. 
Go ahead. So I just want to say, so you might notice the color that I'm wearing today. It's the color of green. In my culture, the color of green is the color of hope. And so I am hopeful that today's conversation that has been put together by these wonderful NCEL and um, uh, the Boston University and the Wheelock College, that we uh, know that we can always move forward and onward uh, together. And for me, the kind of work that um, we're doing right here have also been in that multi-tiered system of support, but we did it with the lens of English learners. And we have a free website that we're giving you, MTSS for Ls. And in there, we really describe, you know, here's, here's what we know, here are the things you need to think about, here's some rubrics that could be helpful as you try to implement this systemic change. We have also have what are called the Knowledge and Practice Standards for the Teaching of Reading. And we have that at dyslexiaida.org. And what we did is we designed what it would take for teachers. What are the knowledge that they need to be great at implementing uh, this whole structured literacy approach? But we also did it for the Spanish language, and it's not a translation. We gathered up experts and we did this for the Spanish language. So the knowledge and practice standards for teaching Spanish reading are also there. And I've just recently updated it and I'm getting people from other countries to look at it and um, it'll be up soon. So what is it that we want our teachers to know? Because our teachers teach and they make the difference. And so that's important. We're also working on assessment guidelines and we've been, we have these rubrics for assessment across languages, assessment guidelines for dyslexia, assessment guidelines for learning disabilities. And those will be, they're being vetted right now. And so those will be out soon. And so keep in tune to Learning Disabilities Association, the International Dyslexia Association and the National Joint Committee for Learning Disabilities. And these products, we make them available for free. And it's right, it's just really about, everything is a process and it's never one size fits all. We know that. Mm -hmm. And so we want you to know kind of it's, here's our thinking and here are all the things to consider and here's how to reflect upon what you're doing and how to do better. And we are going to make this, we're going to really make change, but we have to go onward together. There's a lot to read. <laughs> <laughs> we gave you a lot of assignments. Uh, Nicole, do you want to um, give a piece of advice or takeaway to the room? Yeah, sure. So um, I think from, from my work, right? It's um, for all of you who are in the classroom or classroom adjacent, right? That evidence-based science of reading informed instruction works and we see the brain changing in response to that instruction. So think of yourselves as actually, right? Being able to modify the brain through that process for, for struggling readers, right? For kids with learning disabilities. Um, and then the other thing that I would say is, especially for those kids, and, and within that set, especially those kids who are, are really still um, struggling a lot and not responding, pay attention to what, what you see, what they're doing, and don't give up on them. I think one of the things that, um, you know, I've been in the field for about 20 years now, um, you see is that there are sort of trends and fads in terms of ideas of what we think is going on with kids who are, who are really struggling readers, right? And so for a time, right, you couldn't talk about visual processing problems. It was all phonology, for example. That is changing now, right? We know that this is a complicated, multifactorial uh, problem that these kids have, and they're gonna need more, right, than what other kids are getting. All of that other stuff is good and important for them too, but they probably are gonna need something else. So pay attention to that. Um, and if you have the opportunity to partner with scientists, cognitive neuroscientists, communicate what you're seeing. Um, we're trying to learn from people who actually have this hands-on experience. So that's what I That's a really cool point. It would be so great if there were more of these kinds of partnerships mm -hmm. and interaction because I think teachers and people in schools see things that you should know mm -hmm. and obviously vice versa. Mm -hmm. So we're going to move to a few questions. I have some questions on cards here. Um, I think this is a good one based on everything that was just said. But how can we know that the interventions we're providing for struggling readers are actually evidence-based when, in fact, the empirical data supporting most popular interventions is still lacking? Mm -hmm. Does anyone want to take that one on? Mm -hmm. So um, we, uh, Claude Goldenberg and myself and Lillian Duran wrote, uh, and I don't know, uh, I have to, you know what, I didn't put that in the, we'll we add. need to get, we, we have adding. a couple of reports out there and we talk about the evidence-based uh, practices really from the lens of English learners 
you have, you know, the evidence that, you know, you've been working on for years. But when we talk about evidence, um, we, you know, these studies were done over 15 years of time. And so it was the development, it was the implementation first with us as, um, as you know, experts, then at schools and what are called, were called the scale-up studies. And so, you know, we talk about, uh, you know, here are the key features. Here's the, we added oral language proficiency to our, um, to our, you know, so it wasn't all about, you know, yeah, they call us phonicators, but no, we're not just all about phonics. We have to simultaneously be working on their oral language, their oral language proficiency, their background knowledge, the vocabulary, so that as they're learning to read, they're also also developing that language to make them great writers. And so I think that that's uh, important, and I think we need to put those uh, reports out there. But we have these guides called the IES practice guides, and our work is highlighted in there. And when I ask, okay, let me just ask you all, how many of you know about the IES practice guides? Raise your hand. Oh, of course, we're at Boston U. Of course we are. <laughs> Typically, well, there's a lot of people who know about them, but people who don't. Yeah, so, so IES practice guides, and in there you can, they're beautiful because they're they really give you good. five recommendations. They tell you here are the studies, here they met the gold standard, and here are five recommendations. Here's what we have the strong evidence, here's moderate evidence, and here's little or no evidence. You need to be you know, following that, and I think those are wonderful guides. They're easy to read, and they tell you this is what we know, and these are the interventions that work, and this is what you should look for. I think it's more helpful to go to those than to look at particular program, um, yeah. uh, at, like the What Works Clearinghouse, formerly known yeah. as, I guess. Um, yeah, I think those guides are really, really important, and there's just you know great footnotes and lots of you can sort of follow the trail. Do you either of you want to add anything to evidence-based interventions? How do we know? I would just I would add to that. I mean, the, the practice guides are a great resource. The U.S. Department of Education has made it its mission to try and translate research into practice, mm -hmm. and so they're very focused on trying to create mechanisms for that. The National Center on Improving Literacy is one of those mechanisms. So our one of the things we do is collate resources that have been vetted for having strong evidence behind them. Mm -hmm. um, there are other sort of repositories that attempt to do the same thing to make it easier for educators to, to parse through all of the noise and find things that will actually work. The practice guides are great because they're not intervention specific, right? They're gonna focus on practices that are largely going to work for kids based on the evidence that is available. Um, so I would encourage people to, to look at those resources and come to our National Center on Improving yes. Literacy website and find some things and, and email us with questions. I think those uh, practice guides really contribute to the knowledge base too because it helps people know what practices are effective and why and then you can look for those things or not in the programs or materials that you have. And it tells you what's n what we don't have strong evidence for. Exactly. Do you want to add anything to that? Um, I think you guys have pretty much covered it, but just, right, this, the science is not necessarily evaluating a particular program, right? But what you can get from the science is what features, right, have been shown to be successful, right? And making sure that your program has those features. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. that's a really good lesson. Okay, so I think I'm going to ask maybe one more question to try to get us all back on track unless you all want to tell me. We have ten more minutes? Okay. okay. All right, well, and then more than one question. We're okay. We're doing fine. All right, here we go. Um, so the next question is, if you could spend a couple of minutes with a first grade teacher, they're from, a Fountas and, they're from Fountas and Pinnell times, is what it says on here. <laughs> if you could spend a couple of minutes with a first grade teacher who's been teaching Fountas and Pinnell, what would you tell that teacher about reading? How open are they to changing their practice? Um, <laughs> I, well, you're not supposed to ask a question. You're supposed yeah. to tell them something. I, I would, I, so I'll, I'll start. I'm sure my colleagues will have much more to say on this than, than I do. But I, I mean, I would start with uh, talking to them about what the science of reading is, um, how many years of research we have supporting the idea that kids need to be explicitly and systematically taught phonics, that there are some things that they're doing that maybe do work for some kids. There are some things that they're doing that maybe they can continue to do. But there are other things that they're doing that need to change immediately. And there are tools that we have to allow them to do, it, to do that. So, for example, uh, the project that I mentioned that I started working on when I was a graduate student is a systemic intervention. It's called Enhanced Core Reading Instruction. And the reason that it was created was because there were holes in core programs, and we wanted to make the phonics instruction better. So it takes the existing core program, which could be Fontas and Pinnell, LLI, other things, right? Mm -hmm. 
And it takes the scope and sequence and makes it more explicit and systematic for teaching phonics specifically, but also provides tools for enhancing vocabulary and comprehension instruction to make that more explicit so that it's accessible to everyone because we know there are so many readers in first grade uh, in general education classrooms who are not benefiting from the core instruction. So I would work closely with that teacher on changing their practice, providing support for changing their practice, explaining the rationale and sort of what the science of reading is, but also providing the tools that allow them to enact the science of reading thinking about how they can examine their implementation. So in school systems, we don't often look at implementation of practices. So we adopt a program, we use it, and then we say it doesn't work, and then we throw it out, and then we try another one without examining fidelity of implementation or whether or not we're actually implementing the evidence-based practices that we should be implementing. So examine your, your implementation, ask colleagues to do that, engage leadership in supporting you to do that, and also look at student performance data. So we do have relatively good screening instruments, particularly in the early grades, for identifying students who need additional support, use those data sources to support decisions about that and use those data sources to support adjustments to your instruction for differentiation, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I would also work with that teacher to structure their reading block so that they're focused on providing instruction in efficient ways. We mm -hmm. often see in first grade classrooms students spending a lot of time in small groups with mm -hmm. the teacher. If I'm a teacher and I'm teaching 30 students and I'm working with students in small groups and I don't have additional support, I can only work with a small group for a fraction of that time. Mm -hmm. So how can we use our whole group instruction mm -hmm. to engage students and benefit all students mm -hmm. better? How can we make that the majority of instruction mm -hmm. with small groups being a, a fraction of the time mm -hmm. for differentiation? Um, yeah. One thing I saw uh, in a reporting trip that I was in is a principal speaking to the fact that principals are really important in this who had gone through a lot of training on the, mm -hmm. on the science of reading. And one of the things that she was doing is she had these big pieces of, you know, those big post-it note things all over her mm -hmm. office and a big conference room because teachers would come in and she had stop, start, keep. And it was like, here's what we're going to stop doing now that we know about this. Here's what we're going to start doing and here's what we're going to keep mm -hmm. because a, some of the, a lot of the stuff we're doing is good. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, great and, teacher advice. And, and I think that's a gr just what you're describing. I think that's a great way to approach it because, you know, you're not going to tell a teacher, oh, you've been doing something that isn't evidence-based. Let's look at your practices. Let's look at what is evidence-based, as you're describing, um, Nancy. And then uh, let's see how we can be comprehensive. And I really do um, like, uh, first of all, the data. <laughs> what is the data? What what do the data show? Right? How are your kids doing? Are there some that you know maybe some kids can just read without that? instruction, but most kids will need that instruction. So I think it is a matter of, watch Sold a Story, and, uh, um, but I think it is a matter of, you know, how are, you, how are your students doing? Let's talk about what works, and I agree with Nancy. When Right now we have a project called Model Demonstration Project for um, uh, Dyslexia, and it's just really interesting. We couldn't even work on dyslexia because we had to work on the core instruction first to make sure that it was comprehensive and that they were using evidence-based practices. And so, I, and, and here's the other thing. It's never about like, you know, we have all the answers and we're just gonna push in here. It's, it's a collaboration and it's building trust. And it's building trust, we build trust with our school leaders, trust with our um, uh, teachers, and we begin slowly, it's a process of slowly moving that needle. Um, and, and you know, sometimes we get very impatient and we want things done fast. But the thing, the thing of it is is that we have to build capacity, and so it starts with the school leaders and the parents. Uh, I can tell you that everything that we do involves the families because uh, they are, were, are the first language and literacy teachers, and uh, they know so much about um, the students, and I think that's the other thing. How do we engage our families, and how do we implement the evidence, and let's progress monitor, let's implement, but let's build this network of improvement community. Mm -hmm. I think know? this is like a central tension always here is between the sort of urgency versus the time it takes yeah. to get it right, right? So there's obvious urgency, listening to Tracy this morning, there's urgency here because there are kids who are entering first grade uh, next year mm -hmm. <laughs> and we need to get it right for these kids. But at the same time, if you try to do things quick, you might not do them well. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, we're at a, a delicate moment because there's like urgency coming here again. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, we're, we might do the thing where two years from now we'll be like, well, that didn't work, mm -hmm. let's move on. Mm -hmm. And I think there needs to be an understanding that the, you know, change takes, good change takes time. Mm -hmm. Do you have any advice for the first grade teacher? 
Yeah, so, I mean, in addition to all of that, um, I'd probably send them to your podcast, Emily, because yeah. I think a narrative mm -hmm. and examples um, are worth so much. Um, and then I might tell them about um, the first scientific paper I ever published in 2006, where we took first graders, high SES school, we had words, we pre-tested them to make sure they didn't know these words, right? And we either had them try to read them, sound them out, a training session in isolation, or we read the context to them and had them read them there. Um, they did better in the context in that moment, but then later, right, in the next instance when they had to read them alone, a day later, they did better if they had to sound them out, right? And yeah, so yeah. I think evidence, right, That's providing that evidence when you can goes a long way. It's not going to be perfect. We have to do all these other things, mm -hmm. but a little bit of science might help. I read That's that paper. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. Did you give that in the resource? Um, I think no, I'm going to do one more question on the 10 minutes thing. Am I, are we, are we good? I think we have four more minutes if I was counting right. Okay. So this is like speed round because supposedly we have about four more minutes. So how can we screen dyslexia versus another type of disability? Or do kids with dyslexia have an array of disabilities such as language processing or processing speed, et cetera? So this is fascinating. This gets to sort of what is dyslexia, some of the things we're trying to understand about what is really going on. So can you quickly say one thing about that, dyslexia versus understanding something else going on? Who wants to start? I'll jump, I'll jump in and get it. Uh, okay. So uh, this is a really important issue because uh, so I work in school-based contexts. I don't work in clinical contexts, and clinical identification of dyslexia often looks different from school-based identification of dyslexia. Mm -hmm. When we're talking about reading screening, a lot of our reading screeners fo for universal reading risk focus on foundational reading skills, right? Um, how students are pronouncing letters, the that they know their their letters, that they know the letter sounds, that they can read words, that they can put those words together sometimes comprehension. We try and map those screening measures onto sort of the five big ideas of reading or the five pillars of reading. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the early grades when we're screening, many of our screeners are focused on things that are completely germane to dyslexia. So dyslexia is a word level reading disability as, as we characterize it. If we're assessing it in schools, we can use our universal screening measures very well in our school context to identify students that have risk for dyslexia, screening measures are never intended to diagnose mm -hmm. students as having anything, right? So our, our reading screening measures in the early grades tell us who is at risk for not being able to read words well and put those words together to read text, which is the struggle that we see students with dyslexia experience. So I would encourage school systems to use their universal screening systems for dyslexia screening with the addition of some other tools potentially as more intensive supports are needed for students or as they're moving toward an identification uh, mm -hmm. approach of dyslexia. Mm -hmm. And so um, along with that, um, what we need to also see is, you're right, so in the universal screeners, we're looking at those foundational skills of literacy and some of them will add you know, that language component. And what we need to make sure of is what Tracy talked about, the disteachia, because if you've got everybody that's at risk, right, then you know, oh, we're not, we're not really providing the type of instruction that most of these children uh, need. And the other thing is, is, uh, is and as I mentioned before, that we need to look, if you have an English learner, we're going to be looking um, across um, those languages. But what we find, if you have a multi-tiered system of support, right, if you have that MTSS model, then it's those students. Yeah, we're screening them in kindergarten and first grade for, you know, those at-risk factors. But it's those students, when you gave them the instruction and you're really focused and implementing, and they're not making the progress that they need to make, then we're going to really look comprehensively and deeply at, you know, um, these skills. And so it's those students that, despite that evidence-based instruction, they're still not getting it. And we need to do something early, and we need to find it early, not when they're in ninth and tenth grade or fifth grade. I mean, that's too late. Right, and that happens all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Last thought, Nicole, about yeah, just dys dyslexia and other disabilities, other things going on? Yeah, just ditto to all of that, but, you know, as you point out, right, it's like you need to know about the child, yeah. right? What is their history? What is their language profile, mm -hmm. right? And th there just isn't an easy answer, mm -hmm. right? I wish we had one, mm -hmm. right? But it's like we need to have a way to get all of this information available to folks so that they can, at a glance, have it. And I don't know, we don't have it now. It would be great to have that. 
Well, thank you all very much. And I would say that if you send people to Soul to Story, the first grade teacher, I hope you will then send them to all of the things that these women are putting together for reading, because I really do hope that my work is sort of like an appetizer for people, and then that gets them interested in knowing that there's so much more to know, and that it's important to know it, and that this stuff is really interesting, and that if you know it, you can, you're really better equipped to help kids. And that's what I think everyone in this room is trying to do and do better. So thank you very thank much. You. Please give a round of applause to the panel.